Hey guys, Chris here, and I'm a Ukrainian Canadian. Today is November 21st, 2023. Let's get to the news happening in Ukraine, shall we? So three updates from Donetsk. First of all, in Avdivka. Since my last update on Saturday, the Russians have not had any success at encircling Avdivka, so the gains remain the same since my last update, so this is excellent news. I can also say with confidence that also winter has arrived in Ukraine. We're seeing a lot of footage of either snowfall or very muddy terrain across the front line in Ukraine, so this makes for very difficult now uh, advancements for both sides, which is good news for the Ukrainian forces in Avdivka because the Russians will exclusively now rely on infantry attacks to be able to try or to try to encircle Avdivka, uh, which is not going so well for them. In the last six weeks, they have lost over 10,000 men, hundreds of armored vehicles, um, and it's just pure madness for the Russians. But they have been given the order to take Avdivka by the Tsar, so they will do everything necessary to do so. But with the winter approaching, obviously this is going to slow them down. It will provide more time for the Ukrainians to uh, be able to figure out you know, better defenses or even some counterattacks of their own, if possible. The other update I want to talk about is in Bakhmut. So in Bakhmut, um, unfortunately, the Russians have managed to gain a little bit of ground close to Klishivka, uh, which is south of Bakhmut. As you can see, uh, they have kind of entered the northern, northern part of Klishivka in the last few days. Um, so that is another update for Bakhmut. And the same goes for the north. The Russians have done a small little push around the area of, between Yahidna and Khromove in the north of Bakhmut. Uh, but these are just small little gains from the Russian side. The Ukrainians still control the majority of the heights overlooking Bakhmut, which is what is extremely important. And the last update for Donetsk is an excellent update, and that is for the village of Kumachove, which is bordering Russia. And so today, the Ukrainian forces, I shouldn't say today, but it happened on November 19th, actually, the Ukrainian forces struck um, this village where uh, there was a concert being given to the 810th Marine Brigade. And this happened, obviously, in Kumachove. And according to the reports, uh, basically 25 Russian soldiers are dead as a result of this HIMARS strike, and over 100 Russian soldiers were injured. And among the dead are also is also the elite singer that came from Moscow, I don't remember her name, nor does it matter, uh, that died as a result of this strike. So, um, again, you might say that this was a farewell concert for these soldiers, and kind of a payback as to what happened um, in Zaporizhia a few weeks ago. If you guys remember, a similar situation occurred, but on the Ukrainian side, where the Russians struck a Ukrainian gathering, uh, where there was a ceremony being given for the Ukrainian soldiers in Zaporizhia. So this is an excellent payback, and it shows that the Ukrainians are able, absolutely capable of hitting the Russians in the deep rear, close to the Russian border, which is excellent news. And in terms of Kherson, which is the other kind of very active front right now for the Ukrainian forces, there's still a lot of activity going on between Hola Prestan all the way up to Tavrysk and Nova Kakhovka. So the Ukrainian special forces, among other regular Ukrainian forces, are trying to build multiple bridgeheads to be able to start transferring armored vehicles and build their logistics in the left bank. There's now rumors, again, there are rumors, so nothing really significant, that the Russians are planning to do a goodwill gesture and withdraw close to Veliki Kopani. It remains to be seen if they're going to commit to that, but if there's already rumors, it's showing that the Russians are losing more and more control every single day. And so let's hope that maybe in 2024, the Russians will have to uh, withdraw. Um, and this is going to allow the Ukrainian force to build that buffer zone and have that buffer zone to feel uh, secure and safe to start transferring uh, and building these pontoon bridge bridges to be able to transfer um, more and more troops and armored vehicles in the left bank and start new operations to cut off the Russian land bridge and, and start moving towards Crimea, which would be extremely significant for the Ukraine force because that's what the goal is, is to build, is to cut off this land bridge, whether it be in Zaporizhia or between Kherson and Crimea, it would be very, very effective uh, to bring the Russian um, regime and the Russian forces to near collapse. So that's that for the front line. Now in Crimea, in Saki, the thermal power plant is on fire today, and it's unclear what happened there, but uh, another most likely Ukrainian strike. So the thermal power plant was hit, and it remains to be, you know, uh, it, it's unclear as to uh, what caused this fire. 
Additionally, the Ukrainian pilots have now officially been given the green light to start flying the F-16s. So in Denmark, the Ukrainian pilots are now flying these F-16s with instructors, which is excellent news. It's going to bring Ukraine closer to uh, to flying these very important jet fighters in 2024. To call them game-changing, I don't think so. They might have been game-changing if they had them in the summer offensive, but they're still going to be very important to strike the Russian logistics and Russian command centers in the rear in occupied Ukrainian territories. So it's still welcomed news that Ukraine is now flying them. The Ukrainian pilots are now flying them. And the last update is with the United States. So the United States has announced yesterday that they're going to provide $100 million in defense aid for Ukraine. Again, uh, we let's agree that more funding is necessary. $100 million um, is great, but Ukraine needs far more for the winter. But still very sizable amount of uh, help is going to Ukraine's way. So additional ammunition for HIMARS, Stinger anti-aircraft missiles are uh, also going to be provided, 155 millimeter artillery rounds, 84 anti-armor systems, two launched optically tracked wire-guided tow missiles, Javelin anti-armor systems, and also over 3 million rounds of small arms ammunition and demolition munitions for obstacle clearing and also cold weather gear and spare parts. Uh, for different types of equipment that the Ukrainians are utilizing. So uh, this is excellent news, but we have to agree that, of course, Ukraine is far more than just $100 million worth of military aid. So I hope that in the next few months, Ukraine is going to receive more help from the United States and other partners to be able to continue not only defend itself, but continue its operations against the Russian occupiers in Ukraine. And speaking of Russian occupiers, 10-year uh, 10 years now. It's the 10-year mark of the Euromaidan. And ever since the Euromaidan started, we've seen the chain of events that led us to this full-scale war between Russia and Ukraine. And this was a defining moment for the Ukrainian history, where the Ukrainians sent a message to Russia that they no longer want to be part of this Ruski Mir. They no longer want to have any Russian influence, and they want to be in charge of their future. And so this is a very important day. So let's pay... You know, uh, let's honor the men and women that have fallen in the last 10 years uh, as a result of this Russian brutality and this Russian, you know, um, invasion against Ukraine. So uh, that's another very important thing I want to mention. So that's the video for today, guys. Thank you again for your support. I'm very grateful for your uh, support for this channel. Uh, if you like my content, please like my video, subscribe to my channel. I try to do as many regular updates as possible. And leave me a comment as well about what you think about any of the topics I've covered today. Thank you so much, and I will see you guys in the next one. Thank you, and Slava Ukraini.